I'd like to start this morning with uh, a few of my favorite words. Please open your Bible to the book of James, chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. James, chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Please let's pray together. Lord, you're just so good to us. You, through love, are our Lord. And through that same agape love, you chose to become, become our Savior. And through your living and powerful word, and by your example, you are our teacher. And we just thank you for it. We ask you, Lord, to give us open ears and open minds and open hearts that we might take from your word this morning all that you wish us to know that we might be able to conform our lives to your image as you so instruct us. In Jesus' name, amen. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The Holy Spirit here through James is paraphrasing from Proverbs 3. I think it's interesting to note the importance of studying the whole Word of God. If the Holy Spirit working through James thinks it's important to emphasize something from the Old Testament, I think it's important for us too to give weight to the entire Word of God, Old Testament and New Testament. For every word, every word in this book has been breathed out by the Holy Spirit of God. The Amplified Translation says, God sets himself against the proud and haughty but gives grace continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Jesus himself is very clear about this. Luke 18, 14 quotes our Savior, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. At the same time, James here reminds us that this grace only comes to the humble. Grace and pride are eternal enemies. Pride demands that God bless me in light of my merits, 
whether real or imagined. But grace will not deal with me based on anything that I've done. My self-perception of good or bad is irrelevant. Grace is a gift of God. And our receipt of this gift is only on the basis of who God is. It isn't as if our humility earns us the grace of God. Humility merely puts us in a position to receive this gift that he freely gives. When we ask anything of God, we must do it with humility, for he is our creator. He is our master. He is our Lord. The prophet Daniel in Daniel 9.18 put it this way, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. In all matters, we must come to him not with the intent of bending him to our will, but for us to be conformed to his will. We continue, therefore submit to God in light of the grace offered to the humble, there is only one thing to do. Submit to God. This means to order yourself under God. To surrender to him as a conquering king. And start receiving the benefits of his reign. We should submit to God because he created us. As we read in Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We should submit to God because his rule is good for us. As it says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And in Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. We should submit to God because all resistance to him leads to no good thing. We should submit to God because such submission is necessary for our, our salvation. We should submit to God because it is the only way to have peace with God. Romans 5.8 promises, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul gave us a road map to peace. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing. Think about that. Lee and I have noted in, as we grow older, we take a look at the lives of our children and grandchildren, that they seem 
to live consumed by the worry of being stressed. Uh, I don't remember that growing up, to be honest with you. Maybe some of you other older folks do, but I don't. But here, the Holy Spirit of God is saying, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I have shared with some of the folks in this congregation who have experienced uh, cancer in one form or the other, and I think we've all had the experience of, with the diagnosis, our physician saying something like, you've got to take this more seriously, which gives us the opportunity to say, Doc, we respect you but it's in God's hands. And we're told to be anxious for nothing. For to live is Christ, and to die is gain. C.H. Spurgeon writes, I desire to whisper one little truth in your ear, and I pray that it might startle you. You are submitting even now. You say, not I, I am Lord of myself. I know you think so. But all the while, if you're not submitting to God, you're submitting to the devil. So I would suggest that we all submit ourselves to God. Because God can transform hearts when people trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Instead of being filled with fear, anxiety, frustration, and stress, by coming to Jesus, all can now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, live a life of hope, a life of joy, a life of peace in our text. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. To solve the problems of carnality and the strife it causes, we must also resist the devil. This means to stand against the devil's deceptions and his efforts to intimidate. As we resist the devil, we are promised that if we resist him in the name of Jesus Christ, that he will flee from us. Spurgeon wrote, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you do not submit to God, you never will resist the devil, and you will remain constantly under his tyrannical power, which shall be your master, God or devil, for one of these most. No man is without a master. Resist comes from two Greek words, which means stand and against. James tells us here to stand against the devil. Satan can be set running by the resistance, resistance, or resistance, new word, wow. <laughs> resistance of the lowliest believer who comes in and only in the authority of what Jesus did on the cross. Draw near to God 
and He will draw near to you. Wow, what a promise. The call to draw near to God is both an invitation and a promise. It is no good to submit to God's authority and to resist the devil's attack and then fail to draw near to God. We have it as a promise. God will draw near to us as we draw near to Him. Drawing near to God, it means draw near to God by immersing ourselves daily in His living and powerful Word. His instruction manual for living our lives. His love letter to us. It means to draw near in worship, praise, and in prayer. John wrote in his first epistle. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, anything, according to his will, he hears us. Drawing near to God means to draw near by asking counsel of God. How would you have me do this? It doesn't mean to draw near to him, to give him a multiple choice questionnaire. Well, God, I have job A that's given me an offer and job B. Which of these two would you have me do? That puts us in a position of limiting the almighty creator of the universe. And it doesn't work. To pray in God's will is simply, God, what would you have me do? Drawing near to God means to draw near in enjoying communion with God. This wonderful relationship of love for which He created us. It means to draw near in the general course and tenor of our lives. For He wants us to conform ourselves to the image of Jesus Christ. Because the ground between God and sinner is sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that blood, we can come close to God. The veil between God and sinner has been ripped apart, and we can come close to God on the basis of our Savior's sacrifice. God is here telling us what He wants to do for us repentant sinners. It doesn't say, draw near to God and He will save you, or draw near to God and He will forgive you, though both of those are true. But what God really wants is to be near to us, to have a close relationship with us, to have fellowship with us. Drawing near to God enables us to resist the devil, Drawing near to God helps us to be holy as He is holy. Drawing near to God helps us to sorrow for sin, to be broken by the sins that we commit in our lives, by the sins of which we are convicted by the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in us. Drawing near to God helps us speak well of other people. Drawing near to God helps our mind focus on eternal things. Our passage continues. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, 
and purify your hearts, you double-minded. By drawing near to God, we are able to draw on God's unlimited power. The power to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Again from 1 John. Listen to John's describing this cleansing when we walk with God. From 1 John chapter 1 verses 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We say that we have no sin. We deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How glorious are those words that we who are sinners can fall on the mercies of God which are new every morning. And He is not only willing but desiring to cleanse us of our sins. Through His blood shed on the cross we may wash be washed clean of all unrighteousness. We are able to focus upon God's holy light. He allows us to set other thoughts aside, relegating them to the ash heap of unimportance. Lament and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. As we draw near to God, we will be convicted of our sin. So we lament and mourn and weep as appropriate under the conviction of sin. And in that mourning and lamenting, we are compelled to find cleansing at the cross. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. As, as we come as sinners before the Holy God, not as self righteous religionists, but as sinners seeking God's mercy, we appropriately humble ourselves before Him. Jesus told a story in Luke 18 that explains the difference Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Pharisees were the definition of self-righteous religionists. And tax collectors, in our society, aren't particularly well-liked. Um, I mean, you meet someone and they say, I work for the IRS, you, you know, just feel a sucking sound in your wallet. <laughs> but they're angels compared to the way tax collectors were in the outlying areas of the Roman Empire. These tax collectors 
would set up their own businesses. So if Rome wanted 10 shekels, they had the authority to charge 15. They kept the five. Not well-liked folks. But listen to how Jesus portrays their actions. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus continues, I tell you, this man, referring to the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. And then as we looked at it before, goes on to say, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. What a promise. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And grace is the unmerited favor of God, which always lifts us up. Please, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all you have imparted to us from your living and powerful word this morning. We thank you for the ability to to congregate together, to share the gifts, spirit, that you have given us one with the other. And we ask you, Lord, we thank you, Lord, For as we go through these troubling times, to be able to turn to you and find peace. In Jesus' name, amen.